Hi, this is Simon from Tokyo Productions and welcome to another tutorial for Blackmagic Fusion. And today we're going to be taking another look at expressions and trying to get a little bit further with understanding how they work. Okay, so let's just start off by making a background. So shift spacebar background and let's make it a gradient like that. And let's copy that, Command C, Command V. Let's make this a solid color. Any color doesn't really matter, like that. Command C, Command V. Let's make this another color. Okay, so there's my background color. My two other backgrounds, I want to set the size to 100 pixels square. So 100 by 100, and the same with the other one. Come to the image tab to do that. 100 by 100. And I'm going to merge one of those over my original background and then merge the other one over the result. So I get that. That's my first merge, that's my second merge. So I wanted to first of all explain something about coordinates in Fusion. If we come to our merge node here and we look at our center, we can see that the default position that puts it at the center is 0.5 on what x and 0.5 on y. If we come to 0 on x, that puts it over here on the left hand edge. 0 on y puts it down at the bottom left hand corner there. Now if you're familiar with After Effects, you'll know that they use the top left hand corner for 0, but Fusion uses the bottom left hand corner. So now I want to show you what happens if I adjust my background. So I'm going to make it square. So at the moment it's 1920, 1080. I'm going to make it 1080 by 1080. And you'll notice that that stays again locked to that bottom left hand corner because what the merge is doing is it's calculating these coordinates based on the background image. So zero on the background image is always going to be there. And if I enter a value of one, it moves it across to the right hand side and one on Y moves it up to the top right hand corner. I now want to show you something slightly different, which is what happens if we use transform. So I've got this background selected, shift space bar XF for the 2D transform. You'll notice we've also got a center here and it's also using 0.5 and 0.5 as the default position in the center. You'll remember that we set our background to 100 pixels by 100 pixels. So now I want you to look what happens if I change the X and Y position. So let's set those both to zero. And instead of coming down to the bottom left hand corner here as it did before, it's coming to the bottom left hand corner of the other square. And the reason for that is that the transform looks at the coordinates of the input image. So if I want to move it one unit over to the left, I can just type 0.5 minus one. And you'll see that moves it a whole unit across. I want to move it down one whole unit on Y, I can enter minus one after that 0.5. Moves it down to that corner there. So you notice what I was doing there is I'm using this number field as a calculator. So I can literally just reverse that by adding plus one and plus one. So we've learned something about these fields, which is that we can use them simply for calculations. And that's where expressions come in. So let's do something a little bit more interesting than that. Let's add an expression to the Y position. So I'm going to select the Y position and I'm going to type equals. And this gives us an expression field here just below. And you'll see what happens. We've got an array called point and it's using the existing X value, which is 0 0.5, and it's left me a blank there for Y. So I could enter a value of 1.5 for Y and it would move to the top there. But let's do something a little bit more interesting. I want to bounce this square up, so up and down. So I'm going to use the sine function. So that's S-I-N and I'm going to use time as the variable. So sine, open brackets, time, close brackets. And now if we look at that, you'll see my box is bouncing up and down like that. Now there are two things we want to notice, one of which it's not bouncing 
about the centre. What it's doing is it's bouncing about the zero position. So we can fix that by, just before that last bracket, adding 0.5, so plus 0.5. And now you'll see, hopefully, that it's bouncing about the centre point. Now let's just talk about time in Fusion. If you're used to After Effects, you'll know that time there is measured in seconds. In Fusion, it's measured in frames. So what you'd expect from the sine function is that it would complete its loop in 360 frames. But it's going very much faster than that. So why, why is that? Well, that's because when we enter the expression here, it's expecting the value in radians. So what we need to do is we need to convert our 360 degrees to radians. So if we come over here, we can see how to do that. If I divide 360 by 2 times pi, I get this value here, which is 57.2958. And so if I divide time by that, I will be using radians instead of degrees. So time divided by 57.2958. And now you'll see that if we come to 90 frames, we've completed a quarter of the cycle. If we come to 180, we're back in the center, so we're halfway through the cycle. 270, we're three quarters of the way through, and at 360, we've completed it. So now those 360 degrees are giving us the complete loop because we've converted the results to radians. Now, this is a somewhat cumbersome way of doing it because we're trying to enter everything into this little field here. And if we wanted to get a little bit more complicated, that's going to be a real fiddle. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a different method of entering expression. So I'm going to remove that. Instead, I'm going to right click, modify with expression. And this gives us a lot more control over it. So what it does is it creates a modifier tab. So let's move over to that. So let's open up those controls. You'll notice immediately that our square has moved down to the bottom left hand corner. And that is because it's being controlled by point out and point out has got nothing in the fields. So it's treating that as zero. And you'll remember that zero puts it down there. However, if we enter 0.5 for X and 0.5 for Y, that puts it back in the center or you'll notice that there's a value here called point in one, and that's preset to 0.5 and 0.5. So if I come back to my point out tab here, we can access those, no those values directly by typing P1X, so that's the point one value, and P1Y. And you'll see that that also returns that default center position. Okay, so let's try entering our sine function into this point expression for y. So sine, open brackets, time, close brackets, plus p1y. Now I want you to notice what happens when I press play. It's moving nice and slowly, as if it's using radians. So you see 270, we're at the bottom, and 360, we're back at the center, which is not at all what's happening when we enter the expression here in the main tool. So that's a very useful thing to know that in this dedicated expression modifier window, we don't have to worry about radians, which makes life a lot simpler. Okay, let's have a look at refining this a little bit. I want to be able to control the amplitude and the frequency. So let's set up some controls to do that. You'll notice that I've got some number slots down here. And what I can do is I can come over to my config tab if I want, and I can rename them. So I'm going to open up the number controls there. And I'm going to type for the first one, amp for amplitude. And in the second one, I'll type FREQ for frequency. So now if I come back to my controls here, you can see I've got these first two slots are called amplitude and frequency. And I can use these values in my expression. And I can access them by using N1, N2, N3, and so forth, just as I could access those by using P1 and P2 and so forth. So now if I come back to my point out, I can 
affect the time with the frequency value. So the frequency was n2. So I can multiply time by n2 by typing asterisk n2. So if we come and adjust our frequency here, let's enter a value of 8. Let's increase that still further. Let's try for 16. You can see that's bouncing pretty fast. OK, and we, we can use our amplitude as well. So that's N1. Come back to our point out. And we can enter that value after the brackets, so before the P1. Again, asterisk N1 for our amplitude. Currently our amplitude is 0, but if we entered a value of 4, you can see we can increase the amplitude of that bounce. And we've got these very handy controls here that have got the right names and make it much easier to control the expression. And another thing we could do is we could control the decay so it gradually comes to a halt. So to do that, I'm going to come over to my config tab. Um, I'm going to turn off the number fields that I don't want. So I'm going to just end up with four of them. Come back to my controls. You'll see that's reduced the number. It just makes it easier to look at. Come back to config. Number three, I'm going to call it decay. And this I'm going to call function number four. Come back to my controls. So I want to type an expression into the function field. So I'm going to type equals. And I'm going to type exp for exponential. Open brackets time divided by n3, which is my decay value, and close brackets. So I'm going to set that decay value to something like 20. And now what I can do is I can use my decay to affect the amplitude. So the amplitude, which is the height of the bounce, decreases using this function here. And I can control the length of that with the decay. Remembering that the function is n4, that's what we want to be using. Come back to point out. So I want to use my decay function to reduce the value of the amplitude over time. So I'm going to take my n1 there. I'm going to open a bracket before it, so n1. And I'm going to divide that by n4, which is our exponential function. And then close bracket. And if we have a look at that, you can see that it's slowing to a halt. And we can use our decay control to increase or reduce the length of that. So if I increase the decay to 40, it takes longer to settle down. But what I'd really like to do is show you something a lot more interesting. So I'm going to remove this expression here. So right click remove expression. Set that back to 0.5. And I want to select my other background here, which is this center square. And selecting that, I'm going to type shift space bar XF to put a transform onto that. And I want to have it rotate. So I'm going to add an expression to the transform angle. So equals, and let's just type time. And let's add a multiplier, time times two. So it runs a little bit faster. And you'll see that that rotates anti-clockwise. I actually want to rotate clockwise, so I'm going to invert that by doing minus time times two. And that rotates clockwise like so. What I'm going to do is rename this transform so it's easier to access. So I'm going to hit F2 and I'm going to call it rotator like so. You can also rename by right clicking and selecting rename from the menu there. So I'm going to come back to my transform here, which is the transform for my foreground. Let's have a look at the result of those two. And what I'd like to do is have my yellow square orbit around my central square as if it's a Ferris wheel cabin following the rotation of the center. OK, so to do that, we're going to use our friendly sine function again. So I, I'm going to add the expression back to this transform. So right click on the center, modify with expression and come over to the modifiers tab. So the first thing I want to do is I want to access that rotator angle value and store it 
in N1. So I'm going to select N1, type equals, and I'm going to just type rotator dot angle. And you'll see that when I press enter, that is now giving me the, the angle from my rotator here, minus 103. So now we can come to our point out here, and we can use that N1 value for our expression. So in the X field, I'm going to type cos, which is cosine, open brackets, N1, close brackets. And in my Y field, I'm going to type sine, open brackets, N1, close brackets. And now if we have a look, you can see that that's sort of following along, but not quite. So what we can do is simply add our P1X value, so plus P1X and plus P1Y. And now it's rotating around the center. It's a little bit close to our original. I want it to be much further out. So to affect that, we can use a multiplier. And instead of entering the multiplier into these expressions themselves, let's add a new control. So come back to our controls here. Uh, let's use N2. So let's have a default multiplier of two. So now I can come back to my point out and cos N1 asterisk N2, sine N1, asterisk N2. And now my number two control is affecting effectively the diameter of the circle. So let's have a look at that. You can see that's rotating around at a distance based on this N2 value. And that of course is just two and a half times the scale of our object, as you know, if we remember our coordinates lesson from the beginning. So if we wanted another instance of this on the other side, I could simply copy that transform, so Command C, Command V, pipe my background into it and pipe it over the top of everything else. And look, let's look at the result. So all we need to do to achieve that is to come to this N1 value, which is rotator angle, and add 180 degrees, so plus 180. And you'll see that, that moves that over to the other side. And now we've got those two 180 degrees out of phase with each other. So we could very easily add more instances and simply add a value to that rotator angle in each case. So these are moving like Ferris wheel cars. In other words, they're, they're keeping their own angle of orientation and they're not follow they're not pointing at the center but we could look at one last expression that shows us how we could do that let's just remove this second instance just to avoid confusing everything and let's come back to our transform here and what we're going to do is come back to tools here and we're going to add an expression to the angle let's right click modify with expression and this brings up a second modifier here. You can see it's called angle. Let's close down our center modifier and let's look at the angle. So to make life a little bit easier, I'm going to rename this transform. So F2 to rename it. And I'm going to call this follow. And then what I can do is I can access rotator and follow much more easily. So I want to select my N1 field type equals. And what I want to do is I want to calculate the distance between follow and rotator. So to do that, all we need to do is subtract one from the other. So I can type rotator.center.x minus follow.center.x. And you can see that gives us a value of minus 1.4. And that's the x distance between those two objects. And I want to do the same thing for y. So I'm going to select that, Command C to copy it. I'm going to type equals into the N2 field, and I'll paste that. And we just need to change the x's to y's. So just a couple of things to remember about how we access these values. Center is capital C, E-N-T-E-R, so that's the American spelling, dot Y or X as the case may be, and 
what that's doing is simply accessing that center value there. So now we can use N1 and N2 to affect the angle of our following box. So I'm going to click on the number out here. And what I'm going to type is a tan 2. So that's arctangent, open brackets, n1, comma, n2, close brackets. And what we need to do is we need to invert it. So minus a tan 2, etc. And now you'll see that we've got the second box pointing at the first box. And there's only one problem here, which is something I've overlooked, which is that we grab our rotator box. The yellow box continues to point out or look at the follow box, but it doesn't keep its orbit distance. However, we can fix that by coming to our follow transform here and coming to our center expression. And what we can do is we can link the point one of this to the point one of the rotator, and then we'll be just fine. So what I'll do is I'll select the X field and type equals. And here, inside the brackets, I'm going to type rotator dot center dot X comma rotator dot center dot Y, close brackets. And now if we remove our rotator, the other box and the whole animation follows along with it. So I have got to the end of this very long tutorial about expressions, and I haven't mentioned a feature that if you're an Artifacts user, you'll probably want to gravitate to first, uh, and that's the pick whipping equivalent. So let me just show you it here. I'm going to link height to width of this background. So I'm just type equals into the height field, and it gives me this little plus sign here, and I can drag that to the width. So now, those two values are locked together. Now, obviously this is a very handy function and it's very easy when the parameters are right next to each other like that. When you're trying to link different parameters off different nodes, it can get a bit messy. So that's why I haven't majored on it here and tried to show you that it's perfectly easy to simply type the names of the nodes that you want to access and the parameters that you want to control. So anyway, I hope that's been a useful introduction to expressions and that it's given you the incentive to try it out for yourself. Thanks very much indeed for watching and I hope to see you again another time.